Let's begin Lesson 27 entitled Inventions and Technology. Now Lesson 27 has quite a few TEKS in it because it covers most of the science and technology TEKS for Texas. But let's look at a few of them that kind of stand out. That we want to look at how the, uh, the increase in factories and urbanization affected America in the early 1800s. That we want to look at how the uh, causes and effects of economic differences between the north, south, and west regions developed that we want to look at the economic factors that led to this rapid industrialization and urbanization. And turning here that we're going to look at some important inventors such as Eli Whitney and Robert Fulton, that we will look at some specific inventions and their effects, that we want to look at uh, developments in communication and transportation. How did these new uh, inventions and new technology change the way that goods were made and sold? Uh, we want to talk about the railroads and how science and discoveries and influenced and affected daily life. And finally, we want to look at how industrialization changed life in the United States. So let's move forward. So inventions and technology, here we see in these three pictures, we see a girl who looks to be probably about, oh, I'd say 12, 13 years old, working at an industrial factory, a textile mill. Here we see a farmer and most likely his son using a device called the McCormick Reaper, which we'll learn about. And of course, we recognize a traditional uh, old style railroad, a steam locomotive. So we'll talk about the effect of the railroad here. Let's begin with industry. And in the 1760s, the first textile, and by the way, that word textile means cloth. We want to make sure that we know that word because we're more likely to see the word textile in questions than cloth. But the first textile factories began in England and they invented machines that made threads such as the spinning jenny and wool cloth such as the power loom and these put the cottage textile business by cottage we talk we mean the people who who made these goods by hand in their homes it pretty much put those workers out of business now one of these workers samuel slater in england worked in an english textile factory and he observed and memorized how the machines were made and how they were designed and when he came to the united states he had copies of these machines made. In fact, here we see a replica of a spinning machine, a spinning engine, in Slater's Mill, which was opened in 1790 in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now, the, the uh, workforce that was available to him were uh, young women and children. So the first workers in his factory were young women and children. Now, later on, we're going to see the uh, building of Lowell Mills. In 1815, Cabot Lowell had the idea of bringing the spinning machines that wove the, um, wove the thread and the weaving machines that made cloth and bringing them into a single factory near Boston. Now, just like Slater, he hired young women who history calls the mill girls to run these machines. And he also built boarding houses by the factories because many of these young women were away from home for the first time. They ranged in age from as young as early teenagers, 13, 14 years old, to young women perhaps in their late 20s and early 30s. And by uh, having these boarding houses, it allowed, essentially it, it created an industrial model in which the workers lived by the factory and uh, the factory was able to control their daily lives when they ate, when they slept, uh, make sure that they get to work. But these young women for the first time had their own incomes and it began to get a little taste of independence before marriage. And what we're going to see as we look forward into our next lesson, Lesson 28 on Reforms, as that this taste of freedom would later on give birth to a women's movement in which they demand things such as uh, fair pay and, of course, the right to vote, women's suffrage. Another important invention of this time is interchangeable parts, and for that, history credits Eli Whitney, the inventor from Massachusetts. Uh, sometime in the 1790s, Eli Whitney received an order from the U.S. government for 10,000 rifles which he realized he could not fill this order unless he, rather than uh, crafting each rifle individually, made identical parts which could be assembled uh, into uh, very quickly and done by uh, unskilled workers. This also allowed that these parts could be quickly replaced and cheaply repaired. So rather than having to throw the rifle away, you simply change the part and fix it and go on. Now later on, this uh, interchangeable parts would become the standard for nearly all mass-produced machines which were produced on an assembly line with unskilled workers, which replaced the craftsmen. Now, unskilled workers could be paid less. And as we see here, this is an early example of a, probably around a turn of the century, around 1900, an assembly line. But again, each person had one particular job with that tool, uh, and, they felt, and they did that job over and over all day. And the result at the end of the line was a finished product. So you could produce goods much faster, 
uh, and much more cheaply. Of course, the Industrial Revolution also affected agriculture, and probably one of the best examples of that is the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, patented the next year, 1794. This was also an Eli Whitney invention, so obviously a very important inventor in the early days of America. And what the cotton gin did was that it removed seeds from cotton fibers. Prior to this, cotton was a uh, was an unpractical unpractical product because it might take one worker a day just to pick the the seeds out of a couple of pounds of cotton. So it was simply wasn't profitable for a farmer to uh, or for a plantation owner to grow cotton as a cash crop. But now with the invention of the cotton gin, one person with a cotton gin could do the work of 50 men. It was 50 times faster than hand picking. So the impact of the cotton gin, perhaps one of the greatest in, uh, inventions in terms of impact on the United States and on the world, as a matter of fact. So let's look at the impacts of it. First of all, cotton goes from an impractical to an extremely profitable crop that will sweep the South and make the South extremely wealthy. Now, in order to achieve this, we see a great increase in slavery. If we look at, at the populations of slaves, especially in the deep south, the states such as Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia in that area, we see a marked increase in the, the slave population in the, uh, the first half of the 1800s. And prior to that, ironically, slavery was actually on the decline. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and other founding fathers believed that slavery would eventually go away. But the, with the invention of the cotton gin, we see a huge boom in southern slavery. The other, another effect is that cotton requires a lot of land. Cotton tends to dry the soil out and to draw a lot of nutrients so that after a couple of seasons, the soil would no longer produce, which meant that we needed new lands, and that was to be found west. So the, the need for more cotton drives the, uh, the expansion of the U.S. into its western lands, and of course, that means that natives who live on that land are going to be forced off and their land taken for cotton farming. So if we look here at this graph that shows a, uh, the increase in cotton production during the 1800s, we see around 1790, very little production. Compare that to what we see in 1860, over 4 million bales produced. And the, the American South becomes the world's greatest supply of cotton, in fact, producing 70% of its cotton supply. And especially we see a huge increase here starting around, oh, 1820. And if you look at the, the steep climb, that means a lot more slavery and a lot more Western lands. Another agricultural machine was the Mechanical Reaper, invented in 1831 by Cyrus McCormick. Prior to the Mechanical Reaper, grain had to be cut down and harvested by hand. But the Mechanical Reaper allowed this to be done 28 times faster. So a few individuals using a, a reaper and a horse, which would later on be pulled by a tractor or other device, could do the work of, say, 25 to 30 men. And the result is that you now need fewer workers to, to harvest the crops and to provide enough food for the population. This freed up those extra workers to move to the cities and get jobs in the factories, which again is going to increase urbanization. And then we had the steel plow, invented in 1837 by John Deere. Prior to the steel plow, most plows were made of heavy iron and some were even made out of wood. Iron tended to get bogged down in the mud and had to be stopped and scraped off, which slowed down the process. But the steel plow, uh, first of all, steel is very strong, but lighter than iron. It could also be hammered into a smooth shape. So the result is that we get the self-cleaning plow, by which we mean that it cut through the soil and didn't tend to get bogged down the way that, that uh, iron plows did. This made the steel plow very well suited to, the, to the, the thick, muddy soil of the Great Plains region, which allowed the farmers to move west, and the Great Plains became the new breadbasket of the United States. Today, when we think of the farming states, we think of uh, Midwestern states such as Missouri, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa, states that are in the Great Plains, and a lot of that was deal due to the invention of the steel plow. Now we have transportation, and let's look first at the steamboat invented in 1807, and Robert Fulton is generally credited as the inventor of the steamboat, although other inventors were also working on it at the time. Uh, the steamboat was a steam-powered or a pedal boat driven by a steam-powered engine, and this was used to transport goods and, of course, people along rivers. The steamboats were not necessarily uh, made for ocean travel, but they were very effective along American rivers. 
And the result of this, oh, the other thing is that steamboats could move faster and also travel, travel up and down the rivers. It was able to uh, travel upriver unlike the traditional, uh, you know, traditional boats. And this made southern port cities, New Orleans, Charleston, and Savannah, for example, very wealthy through their cotton trade. So the invention of the cotton gin and the steamboat at about the same time resulted in an economic boom through cotton for the south. Then, of course, we have the railroad invented in the early 1800s in Europe and then finding its way to the United States. Uh, Steam-powered locomotives became very common in the north. and In fact, it was the north's largest industry with 20,000 miles of track laid by 1860. While there were railroads in the south and it was used in the south, the south did not invest nearly as heavily or develop railroads the way the north did. And when we get to the Civil War, we're going to see this as a significant difference between the two societies and, and, and the two sides in that war that made a big difference in the outcome of the war. Shortly after the Civil War, we had the Transcontinental Railroad, which began in San Francisco and Omaha, Nebraska, and met here in Utah. And as a result of this, we now have a railroad that will travel all the way across the country, including through the Rocky Mountains. And this trip could be made in about a week. And for the people who lived back then, this must have seemed almost like time travel. When you realize that their parents and grandparents had taken them several months to make this journey by, horse and, by uh, oxen and buggy, and now they can climb aboard a railroad and make that trip in a week, again, that must have seemed like an amazing leap forward in technology to them. And then we have the telegraph, invented by Samuel Morse. Uh, Morse invented a device that could send electrical impulses, and some of these were very short, which are called dots, and some of them held longer, which are dashes. And using this dot and dash system, he created an alphabet and a numerical system that could be transported along an electrical line, and the result is that you can send messages using this device along that line that can be re that can be uh, received in a matter of seconds. So again, think back to the Revolutionary War and the, uh, the committees of correspondence, the night riders carrying, uh, you know, carrying messages and letters through the night, uh, getting there in a day or two. And now we have a device that will send those very same messages along this line, but do it in seconds. Again, an amazing leap in technology. So let's look at our review of the Industrial Revolution. Now in our class, we watched a film called Living During the Industrial Revolution. And some of our questions that came out of that is, what does the term Industrial Revolution mean? Why did American factories and manufacturing develop first in New England? How did industrialization change the ways in which people lived and worked? What were some social issues and problems resulting from industrialization? And how did the invention of the steam engine affect cities and westward expansion? So that concludes Lesson 27, and we'll move on to next with our Lesson 28, Reformers and Society. We'll see you then.